Welcome to the Someone Gets Me podcast, where you'll hear stories of inspiration and hope realized. Hosted by Diane Allen, intuitive empowerment mentor who specializes in working with people who want to be freed from being stuck in life. You will hear personal stories and professional insights, along with tips on how to conquer overthinking, procrastination, and more. Here's Diane. Hi, everybody. It's Diane coming to you with another episode of a great interview from a man that is wise and fun and happy. His name is Shalev Amar, and he is an attorney in Arizona. And the fun thing about him is he deals with lemon laws and all kinds of things that aren't like the common like corporate thing or personal injury or those things you hear about all the time. And he is an amazingly smart, creative person. He's been able to use his skills and his talent and his intellect to really help people in a litigation process to speed it up so that when there's an issues, they get resolved quickly, which we know is paramount completely in our legal system. But the reason why he's on the show is that and then some. When I met him a few months ago, we had this great conversation, and the thing that really struck me was how aware he was about his own development and caring for people in general. He's one of the attorneys, I have known many attorneys, but he really cares about people and he cares about growing and making the world a better place on lots of different levels. So he's on the show with us today to share with us a little bit about his professional life and how he uses his personal life and the things he's devoted to to really excel in every area of his life, in his family, in his work, and his personal development. So, Shalev, welcome to the show. Thank you, Diane. I appreciate the introduction. It uh, makes me feel better about myself than I normally do. <laughs> I appreciate it. Well, it's the truth, and, and I um, invited you on the show because of, of exactly what I just said. And so I have some questions, but as you, you know, we discussed already, I like to also go off my intuition a little bit and just kind of see where we go with this conversation that would really inspire people to have hope at the end of the day and really you know, feel connected to somebody who has lots of things happening. So let's start off with kind of the basics, a little bit about who you are, how how did you get into law? And you've been doing it a long time. And you've been interested in a long time. So there's, there's something that started in that core heart's desire. And, and I think that would be a great way to start to let us know a little bit about who you are and how you got where you are today professionally. And then we'll launch into some of the other fun things. All right. Well, I'll, I'll give you the Cliff Notes version. A little bit about my background. Uh, the reason I have kind of the uh, eccentric name is I was originally born in Israel. My parents, my mom is actually South African. She met my dad uh, on summer vacation in a kibbutz. She was working on a kibbutz, which is kind of like, there aren't many of them left, but it's kind of like a, a hippie commune that does farming and agriculture. And she met my dad and got knocked up with this mistake. Um, <laughs> Luckily, they decided to keep me, and uh, they got married. So first, close to seven years of my life were just spent walking around barefoot in a kibbutz. And then my parents decided to move out to America. It was just supposed to be for a couple of years because my grandfather, uh, who's South African, he had moved to the States and relocated to Houston at a radiology practice. It was supposed to be for a couple of years. And... Um, we ended up staying, and long story short, um, when I first moved to the States, it was a huge culture shock. Uh, I went from being basically in, the way kibbutzes worked is they would raise all the kids together in dormitories. It's actually a bit of a strange kind of social engineering thing because what they would do, they don't do this anymore, but what they did to me, uh, which caused some abandonment issues, which we could get into later, <laughs> At one year old, they took me away from my parents and, and put me in, in, these, um, in this little uh, kind of baby house dormitory with other babies. My earliest memory is walking around in the middle of the night trying to get home. So apparently what happened was um, I would wake up in the middle of the night as a toddler and try and get home. So that was one of my earliest memories. Um, and you know, it, it's something that was in the background that I didn't realize for a long time, but I do now. 
had caused me a lot of issues in my personal and professional life as an adult. Uh, but in any event, moved to the States, that was a big culture shock too. Uh, but then adjusted, and I'm basically Americanized, as you can tell. Israeli accent only comes out if I'm very intoxicated, uh, which is very rare these days. I always admired attorneys because you would see, you know, the law movies about attorneys who, who basically defend someone who is falsely accused or helped a little guy against a, a company that, that has poisoned the community or the crusading prosecutor who puts away murderers and rapists. So as a huge Law & Order fan, I originally wanted to be a prosecutor. What happened, though, was I was in law school, and I did a couple of internships, and it just wasn't what I thought it would be like. I actually felt sorry for some of the defendants. And in Arizona, they have zero tolerance uh, for drugs. So even marijuana is a felony. To be a prosecutor, you have to go through, at least when I wanted it uh, to be, you, ha you have to go through two years or basically just prosecuting low-level drug crime. So I was not okay with putting a felony on some kid's record for marijuana. That just did not vibe with my beliefs. I actually don't think there should even be a drug war. I think it's a, it, it should be a healthcare issue. And to, you know, to imprison addicts is against what I believe. That doesn't mean that, that I think people should do drugs. Drugs are bad for you. But it's just how do you deal with the problem? I don't believe that criminalizing the problem is a solution. So last minute, I had to basically just find something else to do because in law school, I took mainly criminal classes. Um, so last minute, I, I just uh, basically took the first job I could get, which was at this firm that did Lemon Law um, cases where they help people with defective vehicles get their money back or get a new car or get compensated. And the way the law is written is people also get their attorney's fees. I, I was never planning on doing that, but I actually like that I get to help people and solve their problems. And it's not life or death, like <laughs> like being a prosecutor or a defense attorney. I couldn't be a defense attorney because although people are entitled to a defense, I, I just couldn't I couldn't defend somebody who raped somebody, for example. I, I just couldn't do it. That's the not so short, meant to be short story of how I ended up in this area of practice. Well, that's an interesting journey too. But I, when I, when you're talking about the whole drug thing and felonizing and criminalizing things, I'm like sitting here going, "Yes, that's true. That's true." And and it's interesting that you are really helping people in a way that to them is a huge deal, but it's not something that's going to, you know, even I probably never ask you to go outside of your integrity or your ethics or what you really believe in, in order to help somebody. So it sounds like the perfect thing just happened for you perfectly. And you've been very successful, correct? Well, you know, success is relative. I, I have done well. I've been probably more successful than, than a lot of, of people out there, but I, I have very high standards for myself. You know, I, I just, my ultimate goal at this point is, basically scale my firm to the point that we have several regional offices so we can cover the entire country. Uh, because unfortunately, on my side of the fence, most consumer protection attorneys, especially in the Lemon Law breach of warranty area uh, for defective vehicles, they don't, really, they don't really care about their clients. All they care about is getting paid. Uh, because Lemon laws have what are called fee shifting provisions that allow attorneys to um, allow consumers, that is, to recover their attorney's fees uh, from the vehicle manufacturer. And so, oftentimes, all the attorneys care about is getting their fee. They don't really care what the client gets. And that just doesn't sit right with me. I want to put the clients first. I believe that if you make the clients happy, it will come back to you. Even if there's a case, for example, where let's say it's a low offer, the client's not happy about it, and so you cut your fee so the client can get a bigger piece of the pie under the offer. Now, a lot of attorneys don't do that, but I do that because A, I want to make my client happy, and B, I believe in the long run that the universe, as one of our mentors says, it gives to the giver and it takes from the taker. So, I believe that if I do write by people, they'll leave positive online reviews, they'll even send uh, you know, video testimonials, they'll refer me business, it'll come back tenfold. 
it's about having an abundance mindset and not a scarcity mindset of trying to get as much as you can out of each individual case. I think if you take care of the client first, the money will work out long term. And so my goal is to basically create the Zappos law firms where we put clients first, where people are happy with where they work and they don't have a tyrant as a boss. Like I don't yell at my employees. I think it's very important to treat people with respect and to try and show them the way and, um, you know, get them into self-development and into professional development. And I don't like tyrant bosses. It's a big part of our economy, but I don't think that's the right way to do things. Wow, how refreshing to listen to you. I'm like, oh, wow. And I was remembering our conversation when we first met and you're reminding me about it all again and it, I'm re-inspired. And, and I'd like you to talk a little bit more about, you talked about the abundance mindset and, and I know you have it. And I'm wondering if you could maybe share a little bit about what that means to you. And also, um, how long have you had that? Like, did, have you always had an abundance mindset or did you learn that somewhere? Or, or how did that get woven into how you see things? Because how you're seeing things is so refreshing to the way a lot of people see things. And I think that learning about how you bec- have became inspired and started making these changes would, would be really powerful. Of course. Well, to be perfectly honest, I didn't start with an abundance mindset. I think, frankly, for human beings, our default, unfortunately, is a scarcity mindset. We have a negativity bias. There's a a completely valid evolutionary reason for that. Uh, Because if you think back to caveman times, uh, which is the majority of, of human history, if you were overly optimistic and you saw that speck in the distance, you're like, oh, that looks kind of cool. And it ended up being a tiger. Guess what? Your lunch. So, <laughs> you know, the people like that, those genes wouldn't get passed on. The issue is, is that the negativity bias and basically uh, the survival mindset, look, it served humanity very well for hundreds of thousands of years. It, it kept us alive. The problem is, is in a modern society, when you don't have to worry about being, you know, lunch for a tiger or a lion, that, that kind of mindset is, it's maladaptive. And the other reason for the scarcity mindset is, you know, food could be scarce. You would have to hunt, you would have to gather, you could go without food for long periods of time. Even with the advent of farming, there were famines, uh, there were all kinds of issues like that. So people were trying to hoard whatever they could just so they could survive. But again, in modern society, we don't have that issue anymore. The food is abundant, at least in, in first world nations. And so it's about shifting out of that mindset. It's also, frankly, just societally, uh, there tends to be kind of a scarcity mindset. There, there's the idea that there's a limited pie and you've got to try and get whatever you can out of that pie because there's only so much to go around. And frankly, I don't believe that. I believe that through ingenuity and hard work and the right strategy that you can actually grow the pie and that there'll be more for everybody. I I don't believe that if one person gets more, as long as they're providing value. Now, look, I'll admit that there's certain sectors of the economy, including my profession, where the value is not raised. Uh, You know, people are taking their kind of a leech on society. But I think, you know, you can also get into Wall Street. Uh, and what happened with the financial crisis. But I I think that's the exception. I don't think that's the rule. I think that most business people, most professionals really want to do the right thing. They're concerned about making payroll and taking care of their employees. They want to provide value to their customers or their clients. Um, They're not looking to just make as much money as possible. But I think that once you provide value, sure, more money it comes to you. But, but basically what precipitated the change in mindset for me, um, like with a lot of people, is I think unfortunately, especially as adults, you have to have something really bad happen to get you to shift your mindset. You know, some people have high lows and that's great for them. But for me, I had a horrible low. You know, I was in a relationship that was an unhealthy relationship. The first year was good. The last three years were basically a living hell. And look, there's always two to tango. There were things I could have done better. But basically, I was with somebody who was a narcissist and had 
characteristics of borderline personality disorder. And ironically, my father had borderline personality disorder. Anything could set him off or nothing could set him off. So that caused some underlying fight or flight response within me and kind of a, a low leveling or, or even high level anxiety. Uh, but ironically, as this relationship deteriorated, uh, my partner, she started to do the same things as my dad. She would fly off the handle at any provocation or no provocation. Uh, she was nasty to me. She would disrespect me in front of my family and friends. It was a terrible situation. And I kept thinking like, God, if there's just another way I, I, I could get through to her. But one of the things I realized is you can't change other people. You can only work on yourself. And either they will come around and do the same, or you got to just move on. But in any event, uh, we broke up. She met somebody, and two months after we broke up, they were engaged four months after we broke up. But, you know, that kind of just twisted the knife. Um, I got into a relationship way too soon afterwards myself. I was still had not healed any of the trauma. And so, you know, I was coming from a place of just neediness and anxiety and, and wanting another person to fill my cup. So I got broken up with. So I basically, I got broken up with. And then a few days later, found out that the woman I was with for four years, with one point I thought I was going to marry, uh, was engaged to somebody else who she just met. So basically hit bottom at that point. And the pain was so bad that I just got to a point, a decision point, kind of like Tony Robbins would say, where I said to myself, enough is enough, and I'm going to do whatever it takes to overcome this trauma. I'm not going to keep repeating these patterns in my life. I'm not going to keep living in anxiety and depression. Uh, I'm, I'm going to do whatever it takes. And so, you know, there's a lot of trial and error involved. Lots of dead ends that I pursued, but I was just relentless, and I still am, because I, I refuse to allow myself to get to that kind of low point again. And oftentimes, you know, your your internal matches your external, and if you're in a low place internally, you attract that in, in your outer world as well. Bad relationships, bad business partners, you know, traumatic events. And look, even even in the best mindset, life will still bring you challenges, but the way you deal with them is better. It doesn't send you in a downward spiral. So, so yeah, when I hit bottom, I just, I really got into self-development. I started reading, devouring books, going to seminars. And, and the first book that really brought to mind the scarcity mindset is The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People by Stephen Covey. Amazing book. I think one of the top three to five self-development slash business books of all time. I've read it multiple times. One of, the, one of the gurus I followed, which he recommended really stuck with me. He said, you know, your subconscious, it's very difficult to alter it because it basically records everything. So if you've had a lot of childhood trauma, if you've had a lot of negative experiences in your life, even if consciously you feel okay, subconsciously it's running in the background. And I believe in the law of attraction, but I believe that your subconscious attracts things into your life. In any event, I, I, I read The Seven Habits, and I've, I've read that or listened to the audio book of it probably about 10 times. And one of the big themes that Stephen Covey talks about is the scarcity versus the abundant mindset, and that, you know, when you have an abundance mindset, all kinds of opportunities open up for you. But when you have a scarcity mindset, your life is always limited. There's never enough, um, and you're always just scrounging for scraps. So... So that's basically why I changed my mindset and how. Yeah, that, that is so amazing because I think one of the first books that and people in the whole self-development thing, even though my degree is in psychology and I've always been the helper person along the way, I remember having to go years ago, gosh, um, I was sent by whoever I was working for to some business conference and I'm like, I don't want to do this, you know, what? but whatever, I'll go. And it was Stephen Covey. And I was reading the book a little bit, but I didn't put it all together at first. And I walked in there and he opened it and he said, it's easy to say no when there's a burning yes within. And everything changed for me in that moment um, with setting boundaries and keeping, you know, 
takers out and, and all of those things. And then that book, the same book, that seven habits of highly effective people changed my world dramatically. So you're telling this story and I'm like, yes, that's so true. That is probably one of the most powerful books ever. And, um, and it makes so much sense. And so that's so cool that the same book really bo impacted both of us in, in that really neat way. I love that. <laughs> that's great. Yeah, it's, it's a great book. Yes, it is. And so self-development and professional development is really important to you. And, I, I, um, and for obvious reasons, and you've shared a lot of them. And, and I'd like you to kind of take a moment and talk a little bit about how your professional and personal development and all this work you've done, and you're on purpose about it and on fire about it. You can hear it in your voice and how that has impacted your professional life and your family life. Um, because I know it has a ripple effect and it affects things. And I think a lot of people don't really realize the magnitude maybe of that impact. And so I think you'd be a good person to speak to how your personal and professional development and your dedication to consistently working on things has impacted your family and impacted your profession. Uh, it's had a huge impact. It's been everything. Uh, for example, as far as professionally, I, I did start my own firm with a partner two years into being an attorney. Uh, what had happened was the original firm we worked at, they screwed us out of our bonuses two years in a row. They persuaded us to take a low base salary with a promise of, of performance bonuses, but those never materialized despite the performance. Again, because uh, the head managing partner had a scarcity mindset where he just hoarded everything to himself. So my original partner and I, we started our own firm. I got off to a great start and then two things happened. The financial crisis hit and shortly before that, my original partner, who is a brilliant guy, but he had a drug problem and he, he had an overdose. So he died. It is, it is a terrible waste of a life. Actually, replaced him with one of his best friends who, who worked at a, a, a big firm downtown. And, and so, look, we got things going again, and the partnership actually lasted for 10 years. But unfortunately, we had just a difference of mindset, a different, a different way of doing things. I, I just could not persuade him to see the light. And so we had to part ways. You know, I wish him well. He has a beautiful family. But again, we just didn't see eye to eye about how to do it. As I got into personal development, I realized that I don't have to just kill myself every day at work, um, doing the day to day, that it's about working smarter, not harder. And one of the things that self-development taught me is hire people, hire a team to help you pursue your goals and don't hold anything back. Teach them everything you know. Like I've learned lots of processes and systems and techniques over the years and doing this 14 and a half years, which is crazy. It doesn't feel that long, but it's been that long. And so my goal now, and I'm actually right in the middle of the process is hire extra attorneys, teach them everything I know, be there as support, but not as a micromanager. And, and by teaching them what I know, I mean, prepare scripts, do like mock, mock negotiations, uh, mock client interviews, things of that nature, so they get experience. And teach them how to be a lawyer and how to do the day-to-day. -day. That way, I am there as support. Like if there's a problem that they can't solve, I'm there to help them solve it. Um, if they need extra help with the project, I'm there to give guidance, but I'm not stuck doing every little minutia of the job where at this point, my strength is more public speaking, marketing, um, finding ways to grow the business and, and build better systems. But, you know, there's 24 hours in the day. It's very difficult to do all that when at the same time you have to deal with every single case. And my firm, like I said, I want to put our clients first. I want to treat our, our, our clients better than any other consumer protection firm. And so one of our policies is accessibility. We have a policy where we 
get back to clients within one business day. If we're not on the phone, we have to take the call immediately. That's the firm policy, and I market that. And I want to back up the marketing. I don't want it to be a hollow promise. So to do that, sure, I have to put things in the side if a client calls. But I realize that's not the optimum way to do it. Uh, the optimum way to do it is teach other attorneys and support staff how to do what I do. And then again, I can focus more on the forest through the trees and growing the business. I would have never had the courage to do this if not for self-development uh, because it's scary. It's scary to add people to your payroll. And now you're responsible for, for these other people's basically well-being and, and then being able to pay their bills. You know, puts more pressure on you to grow the practice and, and to market more. Um, but ironically, you know, people look at employees as a cost and it's not necessarily, it is a cost, but it also helps you add value because when you train people in the right process and the right ways of doing things, they can help you grow your practice. They can help you process more cases, help more clients. And so it's about basically, it's kind of like a buffet, you know, in, in Vegas, you have to pay before you get to eat. And same thing with employees, like, sure, you have to pay up front because you have to train them and you have to pay them before they're able to, to take on the workload. But it's an investment in helping more people and in, in growing your firm. And as far as family, or, or I would add relationships to that. I mean, that's helped a lot. I, I've been able to, you know, get family and friends into self-development, into health and wellness information. Um, look, family is challenging, especially, you know, your older relatives, um, unless, they, unless they're open-minded, because people get very set in their ways. And, and, you know, one of my motivations for working on my health and wellness is my father's health, frankly. Because um, my dad, he was, back in the day, he basically looked like a Greek Marlon Brando, very handsome. Um, taller than me, he was 5'11", big, burly, alpha male, and I just saw him over the years deteriorate. He, he basically, after he and my mom got divorced, and then he fell in love again, but that relationship uh, didn't work out, and he just kind of fell into a depression and just started eating just constantly and just kept gorging himself. Like literally, I'm not kidding, would not go five or 10 minutes without eating something. We'd have a huge meal, dessert, and then five minutes later, hey, do you want a snack? And I was just like, dude, can you stop eating? He would wake up in the middle of the night three or four times and stuff his face with ice cream. And this kept going till he had a massive heart attack and triple bypass. And even then that didn't stop him. He still just kept eating a lot and he's got really bad health issues. He's on dialysis, you know, he's close to kidney failure. He also has this neck issue where he can't turn his head. He's just, and he's shrunk. He's gone from 5'11 to about 5'5. Five five. And I, I just saw this man who went from being, like I said, basically a Greek Marlon Brando, like this Hulk type persona to just being this frail, morbidly obese, depressed, man, and it's very sad. And, you know, he could have been so much more in life if he would have just dealt with his trauma, which he didn't. And his demons have ended up destroying him. And so it was a very cautionary tale for me. You know, now I have an eight-year-old daughter. And, and so I tell her little things now and then, like small habits, small routines that you do will make a huge difference in your life long term from having, you know, a healthy, long, prosperous life versus falling apart. And I, I use her grandfather as an example, as a cautionary tale. And as far as, as personal relationships, I've just learned how to have very, very strong personal boundaries. You know, I used to be kind of a pleaser. I, I developed that because, you know, my dad did have borderline personality disorder and you just do whatever you can to not rock the boat you're walking on eggshells and so i developed all these people pleasing habits which i needed to survive as a child but are very maladaptive as an adult in relationships 
Um, because if you don't have strong boundaries with people, they will take advantage of you. And, you know, people will only treat you the way you allow them to treat you. So you have to have boundaries. The way I was, I'm also an empath. So the way I would see it is like, I don't want to hurt anybody. I want to be nice to people. I'm a good person. And then, you know, I couldn't understand why people would mistreat me. And I would think to myself, I'm a nice person. Why is this happening? The reason it's happening is look, you can still be nice. You don't have to be nasty, but you got to set strong boundaries. You got to say, if something's inappropriate or not okay with you, you got to say, hey, this is not okay. Um, you don't have to be nasty about it, but you got to be assertive and you got to make it clear like, look, I care about you. I even love you if it's at that level, but I will not tolerate being treated this way. You know, if, if you want to continue with screaming or being nasty to me or being um, not respecting my time, being flaky, that's okay. You can do you. That's not acceptable to me. So we'll have to move on and, and, and you know, separate on good terms. And it's not easy to do, you know, because again, I always see the other person's perspective. I don't want to hurt other people. But it's not about hurting other people. It's about just, again, setting clear boundaries and letting people know how you want and expect to be treated. And it's a process, you know? Oh, it's a, a process and it takes time and practice to learn and do it really well some days and rotten other days. And especially when you're an empath or, you know, when it, Empathic people have, a, have additional lessons to learn about how to set boundaries and be okay with it and learn how to be comfortable because, you know, the first few times sometimes if you've never set really strong boundaries, you set a boundary and, it, you know, you look around to see if the sky is going to fall in or are you in trouble or what's going on. There's a process to it and it's admirable and it takes a lot of guts and courage for someone to make those kinds of decisions and follow through with them. So it's so inspiring to hear you share about that to me. I'm sitting here listening going, yeah, you know, that's... You're saying so many things that, that I'm sure people are listening to you and saying that, oh, if only I could do that or whatever. And I'm like, well, you can because you have found a way to do it and you're sharing this amazing knowledge so that other people can also start to set boundaries and take care of themselves and learn the things they need to learn in order to be healthy and happy and make better choices. And so I, um, I hope that people are hearing you with, with that intent in their minds because it's, it's brilliant what you're saying. And you, you meditate a lot, right? Every day. Every day you meditate. And, and um, that was a trick question because I knew you meditated. But the reason why I said that and I set that up is that's another point. I was just having a conversation this morning with somebody who is a business person and, and they are very, always very stressed out about their business and they think, meditation is and writing down what your real goals are and really holding yourself accountable and writing and those kinds of things that people who understand self-development do. Um, they think it's kind of wimpy. And, and I look at them and I say, I think you kind of have it backwards. I think the people who meditate and are clear from the inside out and have those good boundaries actually are more effective and happier in the long run. I think that you would probably agree with that sentence, right? Oh, yeah, I agree. A yeah. thousand percent. Um, right. Look, meditation, so many benefits. Um, it gives you better emotional control. It helps put you in a relaxed state, you know, keep you out of that fight or flight where you, you can make bad decisions based on, on fear or survival rather than what's logically the, the best business move to make. Um, it also helps you deal with people better. It, it helps make you less reactive to to uh, neg negativity and uh, over emotionality by others. Um, huge, pro huge, huge proponent of meditation. Also strengthens your prefrontal cortex, um, mm -hmm. which helps your willpower. Um, and again, and frankly, it's just for people who are spiritual, it, it makes you feel more connected to nature, the universe, God, and Again, huge proponent uh, of meditation. A tip that I would give your listeners is this. Some people have a very, very hard time starting a meditation practice. Their mind just races too much, and it's just, it's literally like torture for them to, to sit and meditate. So here's a couple of tips for people like that where it's, it, it's difficult to, to start the practice. Start very, 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 um, set the bar very low, that is. And so 
even if you're starting at say anywhere from two to five minutes in the morning. The key is for it to be consistent. Master being able to do two minutes, it usually takes six plus weeks to develop a habit, it, you know, give or take a few weeks. Once you develop the habit, it doesn't take so much willpower to do. And then you can up the meditation time. I think ideally people want to meditate 20 minutes a day. For me, I most days I'll meditate 35 minutes in the morning. If it's the weekend, I'll try and meditate for an hour. And it's just, again, made a huge difference in my life. I have much more emotional control. I sleep better. Uh, my mind is clearer. Mm -hmm. uh, so meditation it is definitely something that, that people should do. And again, just start very, very small. Set the bar very low. And also, frankly, people just need to have self-compassion for that and for everything. Because a lot of times when people are trying to develop a new habit, They'll have setbacks and then they'll beat themselves up. They'll go on a downward spiral. And that actually is the worst thing you can do when you're trying to develop a new habit. Because look, the natural state for people is homeostasis. And again, that's, that's basically like a temperature dial. If you turn the temperature up uh, and it, the homeostasis is 77 degrees, you turn it up, it, it, it'll, it'll cool down to 77. You make it hotter. It, I mean, uh, you make it colder, it'll heat up to 77. So that's basically how human beings are set up. That's why it's so hard to change habits and to change the things that you do in your life. So you've got to be compassionate with yourself and understand that you're slowly moving that down. You'll have setbacks, but don't beat yourself up. Be self-compassionate and just try again the next day. But meditation is an amazing habit people should develop. Exactly. And so if you're one of those people who beats yourself up, rewind this over and over and listen to what we were just talking about, about compassion with yourself, because it's true with everything we learn, there's ups and downs. We're going to do great and we're going to do not so great. And it's all part of the process. So that compassion and that loving ourselves is so vital for our happiness and our success and all the richness of life that comes from actually making changes. So if you need to listen to this over and over, because that was a brilliant motivational speech there. I loved it because I, even I'm getting more motivated about it. And I, and I love to meditate. And I'm like, wow, yeah, I love that. So I want to talk about one more thing before we um, start moving toward the end of the interview that I think is important too. And that is the mindset and the ability to not let your past hold you back and beat yourself up or letting the old pain and hurts and things like that become such big blocks that, that they look like walls and insurmountable um, problems. And I know that you've done some work on that and you have some inspiring things maybe you might want to say about that kind of thing. And if you want to share some of your tips or some resources, that would be great. Definitely. Look, I, I think unfortunately, so many people will especially if they've had um, traumatic childhood or traumatic even adult experiences, again, that's in their subconscious just running their life. That's why people talk about being triggered. That's what that means. Uh, somebody does or says something and it triggers the trauma, and that's why you have a severe emotional reaction or overreaction. And so, look, it's hugely important to resolve trauma to be able to move forward in your professional and personal life. Uh, for example, people who go into relationships, they project all kinds of negative experiences from their past onto the present relationship. And, you know, oftentimes their partner doesn't even know that they're triggering. Them. And same thing in, in professional life. There could be something that happens that triggers the trauma that could cause a business deal to blow up or, or a client situation to get out of hand. The key, though, it's easy to understand, like, hey, you need to get over the past or it'll affect the future. The problem is rarely is anybody told how to do that. So I'm going to tell your listeners how to do that, several, several ways to do this. So one is what's called the Revolutionary Trauma Release Process. Uh, there's a book about that by Dave, Dr. David Berselli. I've met him. He's a great guy. He also has another book called Shake the Pain Away. And what that is, is these are exercises that fatigue the psoas muscles, 
because a lot of stress and tension is actually trapped in your nervous system and your psoas. And the way it helps you release trauma, you know, if somebody gets in a car accident, you know, they'll be shivering afterwards, kind of in shock. That's actually your body's natural way of releasing shock and trauma. And so the, the thing is, we suppress that because uh, nobody wants to like shake around when something bad has happened, but that's actually good for you. So these exercises basically put your body into that state of shaking the pain away, releasing the trauma from your body that's been trapped for all those years. So that's one method. Second method I recommend is to have network chiropractic treatments. Now, that's basically a PC term. Network chiropractic is more pressure point therapy. It's not really chiropractic work, although they might do some minor adjustment. Um, but it's kind of like acupressure. And network chiropractic, it helps balance your energy and your nervous system. And that's another way uh, to, to get trauma out of your body and to balance your nervous system. Uh, the third method is what we already talked about, meditation. Meditation helps release suppressed emotion. Sometimes people don't understand when you meditate, you'll start to feel a negative emotion. But you know what? That's actually a great thing. That means that your body is processing it and releasing it. Another thing, uh, the Wim Hof method. The Wim Hof method is cold exposure and, and breathing. And so you can take a cold shower or you can buy some bags of ice and take an ice bath. And the way it works is you breathe all the way out to the bottom of your breath, hold as long as possible, and then take a couple of breaths, and then repeat the cycle. And you only need two to five minutes of cold exposure, and it works great. It, it, again, it basically lowers the level of stress chemicals and raises the level of, of, of good neurochemicals. So Wim Hof is huge, highly recommended. And the final technique that I'd recommend to your listeners is what's called a getting satisfaction letter. Oftentimes, the reason why we're stuck in trauma is because the person who traumatized us never apologized and, and probably never will because hurt people hurt people. They're in a low place. They're in their own hell. And oftentimes, you just cannot get them to see the light. They'll somehow feel justified for having done what they did to you or make excuses. Which, and the problem with that is, is when you don't have an apology, your brain is basically cycling an error message because it's unresolved. You, were never, you never got completion for what happened. So the way to give yourself completion, the positive thing is that our subconscious cannot tell the difference between imagination and reality. So use that to your advantage. Write yourself a letter from that person addressed to you, acknowledging what they did, acknowledging how they hurt you, and giving yourself the apology you've always wanted. And look, sometimes writing the letter once won't work. If you have to, write it 10 times. What do you have to lose? The time is going to pass anyways. You may as well get this trauma uh, handled and released and resolved for yourself. And so, you know, with my dad, I had to write the letter many times. With uh, one of my partners who hurt me very badly, I had to write the letter many times. But you know what? It worked. Every time I felt a little bit better, and, and, and then at a certain point, there's like a tipping point, you feel completely better. It's like this huge weight lifted off your shoulders. Yeah, that, those are all amazing techniques. Some of them I've heard of, some of them I haven't yet, and so I was taking notes myself. So thank you for all of that. And I think an underlying piece of all of it, like when you were saying, sometimes you have to write that letter more than once until you actually feel the resolution. And it all comes down to being open-minded, which you've mentioned, and, and willing, and, and you know, willing to take action and actually do something about it. And, you know, we live in a culture that is so stuck in stay in the trauma, stay in what's wrong and wear it almost as a badge instead of saying, well, hold on a minute here. I don't have to let it define my future and who I am so I can move forward and I can actually resolve these things so that I can be, you know, all of what I'm meant to be and my heart's desire can come forward. So these are amazing tips. Thank you so much for sharing all of those. That's great. Yeah, you're very welcome. I think what people have to understand is there's not a magic pill. Yes. Throw the kitchen sink at the problem. There's no reason you should just have an ego about doing one thing and don't try anything else. 
Now look, there's also, for people in a very bad place, there's medication and that can be a bridge, but it's not a permanent solution. You have to get to the root cause of the problem. You know, some of these medications can even cause long-term brain damage like, like benzos. Right. So, you know, and, and also over time you build a tolerance. Um, so look, medication has a place, it does. But I think if people truly want to overcome these issues, you have to do the work. You can't just rely on a pill. You you gotta you gotta institute routines and habits, and just be tenacious and relentless about it. This is kind of the metaphor that that I use to to help people understand what needs to be done. I think that unfortunately, in society, there's still some stigma for emotional problems, and it's ridiculous that there is. A medical issue like diabetes gets sympathy, but if somebody has anxiety or depression issue, people's attitude is, is just like, well, why don't you just get over it? It's not that simple. And you know what, it has to be, it has to be managed just like, just like diabetes. So I think a lot of people have internal resistance against doing these things that I recommend because they feel like they should just be able to get over it on their own and they shouldn't have to do anything. They just need to, to be tougher. But again, you gotta be self-compassionate and people just have to understand that one of my favorite quotes is, success is a process, not a one-time event. If somebody has severe emotional trauma, major emotional healing that they need to do, look at it as, look at the meditation, the cold exposure, uh, the somatic techniques, the network chiropractic, and any other technique. Uh, I believe in stacking techniques, but people need to look at that as it's kind of like an insulin shot for a diabetic. Like, don't feel resentful, because I used to feel this way. I used to feel resentful. Like, God, I have to do so many things just to feel normal. Well, it is what it is. We're, we're all, you can't change what happened in the past, but you can take action to make your, your present and future better. And so if that means that you have to take out half an hour to an hour out of your day so you can have a better day, so your life can improve, and it does improve over time. It's a snowball effect. It's a compounding effect, in fact, over time. And people who have emotional issues or have been trauma, traumatized, they can actually get to a point eventually once these routines have become habits and they've done them for several months or even years where they're actually in a better place than people who have never been traumatized. Mm -hmm. And because you build this scaffolding over time, you build this, this amazing castle and, and, and fortress of emotional healing. And so, you know, I, I urge people, I implore people to do the work. I know it can be hard. I know sometimes you don't feel like it. Do it whether you feel like it or not. You'll always feel better afterwards. Amen. That's what I have to say to that. Amen. Uh, you, it's like I'm listening to myself say it back to me, hearing it through your voice, and, and, and it's true. You're completely, completely 100% on it and authentic, and I so appreciate you sharing with such passion and, and focus because you, it is so true and so accurate, and I've seen so many people put the effort in and do the work, and they do end up happier and healthier in a lot of ways than people who never did any of it and didn't have the big problems to start with either. I, I see that, you know, they, it all transcends. It's kind of like as far down as you go, you go twice as high up or something. It, there's, a, there's a synergy in it that's beautiful. And, and it's so kind of, it was great to hear you mention that. Is there anything else? We've covered a lot of ground in this interview so far. And I was wondering if there was anything else you wanted to share before we say goodbye for this round of great conversation. Uh, sure. Just a couple of things, uh, just a couple of ways to find me if uh, if people want more information. Uh, as far as the Lemon Law stuff, uh, my website is ArizonaLemonLawAdvocates.com, all one word. And I do have a YouTube channel. I, I need to start posting again, but I, I do have some videos about these topics. It's under a pseudonym. I have a young daughter. There's crazy people online. I can sometimes say things that are disagreeable. And so because of that, I have a, a, a pseudonym. It's under the name Lev Graden, G-R-A-D-E-N. So anybody who just does that search on YouTube, it'll pull up my videos. So 
you know, it, it'll guide you more about how to do some of these techniques. Um, there's also some book reviews on there. That is great. And I will put um, the links to both your um, Lemon Law website and your YouTube channel on the show notes along with your bio and everything so that people can directly click from the show notes and find more resources from you. And make sure that when you um, contact Shalev or you listen to any of his YouTubes, let him know you heard him on this podcast and that he inspired you and how he did. Because sometimes when you're, you're inspired and you share with that person how they inspired you. It inspires them as well. It's a dual gift. So, so be sure that you do that since he's freely giving his time and, and passion and expertise to us. And so I want to thank you so much for being on the show today and sharing with us. I, I'm walking away completely inspired and I'm sure every listener will feel the same way. So thank you so much. Thank you, Dan. And I appreciate what you do and that you're making this uh, available to people. Um, you're changing lives and it's a great thing. Oh, thank you so much. So remember everyone, keep your face to the sun so the shadows fall behind you. You are a rock star. So go out there and rock your world with your joy, your brightness, and your wonder. Don't let anyone hold you back. Until next time, be blessed. Thanks for tuning in to Someone Gets Me. To find out more, please visit Diane's website at MissDianeAllen.com. That's M-S-D-I-A-N-N-E-A-L-L-E-N.com. Be sure to take a second and subscribe to the show and share with anyone that you think may benefit. Until next time, remember the world needs your special gift. So let your light shine.